This is Chair Tiffany LeShawn Frimpong. I now call to order the September 12th, 2024 meeting of the Equity Committee of the Board of Education of Baltimore County. I'm excited to be your new chair, and I would also like to acknowledge Ms. Robin Harvey, who continues as the Vice Chair of the Equity Committee. In accordance with board policy 8311, the chair of the committee at their discretion and after consultation with the staff liaison may convene an in-person committee meeting. Otherwise, all committee meetings will be held electronically. Today's meeting is being held virtually and broadcast through Microsoft Teams. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, committee members will state their name before speaking. Ms. Gover, please call the roll of board members to determine the presence of a quorum of the committee. Ms. Ugama Chikukala? Yeah, here. Ms. Felicia Stileski? Present, sorry. Thank you. And Ms. Tiffany Lashan from Pong? Present. Thank you. Ms. Gover, please call the role of staff members on the Equity Committee participating in today's meeting. Ms. Mildred Charlie Green. Present. Mr. Douglas Handy. Present. Mr. Homer McCall. Present. Ms. Susan Stansbury. Present. Ms. Carla Simons. Present. And Mr. Michael Hodge. Present. Are there any other staff members on uh, the call that I have not mentioned? Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. This is Robin Harvey. I'm on the call. Thank you, Ms. Harvey. All right, so the first item on the agenda for today's meeting is an update on hiring. And for that, I call on Mr. Homer McCall, Chief Human Resources Officer. Good afternoon uh, to um, to our distinguished guest here, uh, the Equity Committee with uh, Ms. Fringprong, um, Ms. Stileski, and also other board members. I want to, of course, say thank you for the opportunity to come today to speak to you a little bit about our hiring update. And just to let you know, of course, having the superintendent's priority being closely aligned to the Maryland blueprint when it comes to hiring and retaining highly effective, diverse workforce. Today I have with me uh, Ms. Susan Stansberry. If you could have the uh, first slide. Ms. Susan Stansberry, who is the director of staffing, and then also Ms. Carla Simons, who is the manager of certification. Uh, Mr. Michael Hodge, who's our Executive Director for Human Resources, is also here with us as well. Next slide, please. Okay. Thank you. So we want to talk a little bit about the background and the what and what we're here for today. Just a little bit about the background itself. Each year, school systems are finding it harder to recruit candidates for teacher vacancies created through resignations and retirements. Now, this is just not a problem here in the state of Maryland, but it is across the United States. Secondly, historically, school systems in the state of Maryland have recruited outside of the state to fill teacher vacancies. In fact, many of our school systems or LEAs here within Maryland uh, within Maryland would recruit and hire teachers from states which had surplus of teacher education graduates, states such as uh, Michigan, Pennsylvania, and New York. And then last year, teacher, Team BCPS's Office of Staffing participated in over 72 university visits locally and nationally and hosted several recruitment events. These university visits included historically black colleges and universities here in Maryland, in neighboring states such as Delaware, as well as far as way as Alabama. Next slide, please. <clears throat> this presentation includes 
One, Team BSFS's demographic trend data for school-based instructional staff with an emphasis on teachers. Although we'll be sharing information about principals and assistant principals, we will also share data on paraeducators with an emphasis though on teachers. Secondly, Ms. Susan Stansberry will share what our efforts in the Office of Staffing has and continues to be to recruit a more diverse candidate pipeline to create a more diverse workforce. And then lastly, Ms. Carla Simons will talk about our strategic staffing partnerships with institutions of higher education, which has been created to support our grow our own initiatives. Next slide, please. First, I'd like to turn your attention to the chart and bar graph on this slide, which shows the change in the racial demographics of our principals from school year 2018 to 2019 to school year 2023 to 2024. When we look at the percentage of school principals who self-identify as Asian, we see an increase from 0.62% to 1.88%. When we look at the percentage of our African-American uh, principals, that number increased from 19 to 22%. And we look at the percentage for Hispanic, uh, Latino, that number decreased from 1.85 to 1.2. And we look at the percentage for our white principals, that number decreased from 78% to 74%. Next slide, please. As for assistant principals over the same span of time, from 2018 to 2019 to 23 to 24, Alaskan Native American increased from 0% to 0.69%. Our Asian American decreased from 1.8 to 1.3. Our African American assistant principals increased from 25.3% to 30%. Our Hispanic increased from 1.8 to 2%. Two or more races maintained at a 0.35. Then our white population of assistant principals decreased from 71 to 65 percent. Next slide, please. As for our teacher population, we're looking at classroom teachers slash support teachers. And when we talk about classroom teachers or support teachers, we're talking about those who are teachers of record as well as consulting teachers or resource teachers who are in, the, uh, in our schools across the system. And from 2018 to 2019 to 23 to 24, we see a similar change in the demographics across various races. For Alaskan Native American, increased from 0.3 to 0.2. Our Asian American uh, increased from 1.2 to 1.7. Our African-American uh, teachers increased from 11.7% to 16.5%. Then our Hispanic uh, Latino teachers increased from 1.8% to 2.0%. Our Pacific Islander Hawaiian teachers increased from 0.1, although very little, to 0.18%. Two or more races from 0.77 to 1.2. And then our white teacher population decreased from 84% to 77%. Next slide, please. Now, recruitment of teachers has changed dramatically in the last 10 to 15 years. Although Maryland has historically been an import state for teacher candidates, we have and continue to be more strategic and targeted on our recruitment efforts. What you see here, these two graphs, show the national decline of teacher preparation program enrollees and our teacher preparation program completers. As you can see from these two graphs, this is a national problem. The graph on the left for enrollment shows enrollment of teacher education students in 2012 was a little over 880,000 students. And in 2023, the number declined 
to 591,000 students. That's close to 300,000 uh, student decline over around 12, 13 year uh, a gap, a span. Wouldn't be so much of a problem if this was just uh, within the state of Maryland. This is across the nation. Now, the number of uh, teacher program uh, completers nationally over the same time span is even more bleak. As re represented here on the right, it shows a decline in completers from 213,000 in 2012 to 160,000 in 2023. Next slide, please. So when we look at our new teachers by race in the state of Maryland from school year 2019 to 2020 to 2023 to 24, we see that we experienced a decline in white teachers across the state from 82% to 54%. Our African-American teachers increased from 25 to 30%. Our Hispanic Latino teachers increased from 6 to 8%. And our Asian increased uh, from 3.8 to 4.2. Next slide, please. So when we compare our new teacher demographics to that of our state new teacher demographics over the last three years, we have two rather quick takeaways. One, our numbers are closely aligned to the numbers across the state. And second, we've been making strides to recruit and, and hire teachers of various backgrounds, particularly of, among our African-American teachers, to reflect more of the demographics of our students as noted here. So if we look at school year 21-22, we have about 30.1%. And 22-23, 34%. 0.81%, and then school year 23-24, 33.7%. So how have we been able to do this since we cannot rely solely, as you saw before, on recruiting from colleges and universities across the country? And our next slide, Ms. Susan Stansberry, will share with you the work we've done in HR to support recruiting a diverse workforce. Next slide, please. And Susan. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. So how have we tried to make strides um, to increase our diversity across our workforce? So first, BCPS is definitely committed to hiring a diverse workforce representative of the students and communities we serve. You'll find this statement on all of our recruitment flyers. We attended 72 recruitment events, both in person and virtually. 60% of those events attended were targeted to attend targeted attendance in order to gain teachers of color. While every one of the 72, our goal is to recruit teachers of color, those 60% of those, we went there intentionally knowing that there would be a higher portion of candidates of color. We have worked with HBCUs, both attending events and participating at the colleges and universities, visiting classrooms and developing relationships throughout the years. Events were identified with a strong population of diverse candidates, either based on the population of students at the college or university, or they, we have attended events that were specifically advertised and attended for diverse candidate participation. We continue to recruit and develop our relationships in Puerto Rico, both through colleges and universities, as well as referrals from our current teachers who have joined our team from Puerto Rico. We have increased our online activity via LinkedIn, Handshake, and Indeed. We are also partnering with the Department of Equity and Cultural Proficiency for candidate recruitment and follow up. Next slide, please. I'm going to turn it back over at this time to Homer McCall. Thank you, Susan. In addition to the recruitment efforts that Susan has shared in the previous slide, we've turned to more creative models to increase the diversity of our teacher workforce. One way is by providing support to our paraeducators through various grow our own initiatives. This slide shows the demographics of new paraeducator hires from school year 21-22 to 23-24. to 24. Specifically, our numbers of African-American paraeducators was 
45% in 21-22, 46% in 22-23, and then 43% in 23-24. Although these numbers may not be as large as our teacher hires, they do give us an opportunity to recruit from a pool of candidates with more diverse backgrounds. So what are we doing as a system to support our paraeducators to become teachers? At this time, I'd like to turn the presentation over to Carla Simons to explain more about these initiatives. Next slide, please. Carla. Thank you. Um, so I, as, as Mr. McCall shared, I'll briefly walk through each of the initiatives you see on the screen. Um, in 2021, we started our growing programs um, with the emphasis on uh, attracting paraeducators uh, into the teaching profession. We established three post-baccalaureate certificate programs um, through the institutions you see listed, and all are scheduled to complete this year. Um, one group has already graduated from Goucher College. They all earned their Master's of Art in Teaching in Elementary Education. Uh, in spring 2023, we partnered with Bowie State University to offer paraeducators seeking to earn their bachelor's degree the opportunity to enroll in a board-approved program. Um, this is a five-year program. It's currently underway, um, and it's due to conclude in 2027. Um, moving forward, an effort to increase the diversity of our teaching staff, we partnered again with Bowie State University, uh, as well as three other Maryland local school districts on a grant application offered by the Maryland Higher Education Commission. Uh, the grant parameters specifically targeted or targets underrepresented minoritized paraeducators seeking to enroll in Bowie State's uh, undergraduate program for either elementary education or early childhood education um, with a dual certification in special ed. Uh, the grant covers the cost of the tuition for up to 21 credits. Uh, books, and even a laptop and monitor, little side monitors, pretty cool. Um, they all uh, participants were able to uh, receive this grant, and the grant was awarded um, for another year. Um, some BCPS paras um, enroll in teacher preparation programs and reach their internship phase of their program, and they're paused. Um, there's no way for them to not work full time um, and complete the internship requirements. So through the Maryland Leeds grant, we were able to support five BCPS paras with completing their final internship year uh, without needing to take a leave of absence or seeing a break in pay. Um, we supported them with completing this step um, and they were trained as a earn while you learn model uh, as a teacher fellow. Um, building upon this teacher fellow model, we established the teacher apprenticeship program or BTAP. Uh, it is a partnership with Loyola University of Maryland. Um, we are in currently the inaugural phase or year. Um, it is underway. Uh, we, we do have a goal of registering the teacher fellow uh, as a paid apprenticeship through the Maryland Department of Labor. Um, in collaboration with Baltimore County government and Baltimore County's Education Foundation, uh, we launched an advertising the Diverse Teacher Recruitment Scholarship. It's a one million grant um, that supports efforts to recruit, train, and retain diverse teachers and women in STEM fields. Uh, the programs I highlighted, again, as Mr. McCall started out with the presentation, they align with the blueprint for Maryland's future, pillar two, high quality and diverse teaching staff. So we'll continue to expand these strategic staffing initiatives. Uh, there are about 45 paraeducators across these programs, uh, of which 55% identify as other than white. The programs are small in number, ranging from five to 10 participants. 
um, the programs are new initiatives and are start have started out as pilots, but we will continue to build our grow our own programs uh, to support our efforts to recruit and retain and train diverse teachers. Um, and moving forward, these programs will infuse a tailored support for the individuals. Um, and we will also identify additional grants and teacher preparation partners. Thank you. Mr. McCall. With that, we want to say thank you and of course open it up for questions. Thank you both Susan and Carla. Thank you for the presentation. Are there any questions for Mr. McCall and his staff? I do see Ms. Delusky's hand raised. Hi there. Thank you. Um, it's really incredible all of the efforts that are making are being made to diversify the workforce. I have one just quick question, then one a little more complicated. So in slide six, what does TPP stand for? I'm sorry about that. I, I, and I kind of said it kind of quickly, but it's teacher preparation program. OK, I figured it was something like that. And then um, my other question, in terms of slide um, slide 11, the, the Maryland Leeds grant, I know you said there were five paraeducators that were part of it, which is amazing, and it ended in the spring. Um, so, you know, of course, I'm sure you all you know, we're able to evaluate its effectiveness and it, it really sounds like all of these grow our own programs are amazing. And is there any plan to try or the ability to renew the grant to try to offer it to more potential uh, teachers? Thank you. So the Maryland Leeds grant ended, as you know, um, it, it's not available for reapplication to my knowledge. You never know what, what the state will surprise us with. Um, and if we are surprised, we definitely will take advantage of it. Um, but our program with the teacher apprenticeship with Loyola is, is what you see as the extension of okay. that opportunity. Yep. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Are there any other questions for Mr. McCall and his staff? I have some myself, but I wanted to give others the opportunity to ask first. Okay, so this is board member Frimpong and I have quite a few questions. So <clears throat> thank you for the presentation. It's good to see the information and have an understanding of the breakdown and the efforts that are being done. Um, so my first question goes to the slide with the principals. Um, and so I noticed with the total count, um, I believe that's slide four on my deck, um, that the numbers vary. And so at this time, I thought we have about 176 schools in BCBS, um, but for the 23-24 school year, uh, when we look at principals, we only have 166. So where are those, I guess, where's the gap or where's, where's the remaining principals in that information? It's a very good question. Thank you for that. Um, as a matter of fact, when we look at our comprehensive schools, those are included there, but then we do have some that may not be included, which would I say would include those other our centers. Uh, we have uh, a number of, uh, I'm going to say maybe RICA may not be included as there, as well as the um, um, White Oak. Um, then we have all Ridge Ruxin may not be in that number, but mainly it's those that are the comprehensive, but I can get an actual list of those that are representative of that uh, number that we have on that screen. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I guess with that list, once we have that list, we will know exactly like what is the actual number. Okay, 
Yes. But, got it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and then next, uh, just kind of talking about the um, numbers and as we look. So, for example, um, I'm trying to pull the numbers. So for our teachers, slide number six. If we look at the 2021 to 2022 school year in comparison to the 2022-2023 school year, we see some uh, large increases in the number of Black teachers as well as Hispanic teachers. So for Black teachers, it goes from 1,152 to 1,365, mm -hmm. and then uh, for Hispanic teachers, it's 209 to 234. But then, um, and while we do still see progress again, um, the subsequent school year, are we able to, or has your office actually been able to identify, like, what were those things that happened between those two school years that gave you those results? So you're talking about, you know, you guys are doing a variety of things, but how do you guys actually use um, data like this to shape your efforts in recruiting and hiring? That's a very good question, Ms. Finbrog, and I will also allow Susan to chime in, uh, but I will say this. Uh, keep in mind, too, that this was just right after the pandemic. Uh, so that was um, one of the, um, I would say, we, well, not only just challenges with recruiting, but at the same time, we had um, more um, teachers of color who may have submitted applications during that time. But that's, I just want to say that it's not just a speculation, but knowing after the pandemic, there were num a number of different anomalies that that uh, that uh, took place um, during and then just post the pandemic. So uh, that may be part of the reason why we had an increase there, but it was a very good uh, question and very good uh, um, uh, catch. It's something we had noticed, but at the same time, the one thing that we can probably attribute it to is just knowing that this is just after the pandemic. Uh, and I can open it up to anyone else who may have any suggestions around it as well. I'm looking at it thinking total numbers as well. We're looking at percentages, looking across the, the total numbers and the difference. Um, to be honest, some vacancies and retention, I think through that whole pandemic situation were definitely impacting. Okay, and so I guess that addresses that specifically, but then I guess the other piece of that question when I had asked about how are you using this data to help um, shape your efforts. So even for example, on one of the slides it talks about um, there's 72, let's get to that slide. So slide number 10, that there were 72 <coughs> recruitment events in person and virtual. So mm -hmm. it said specifically for teachers of color, that that was 60% of the recruitment events. So that would actually end up being like 43.2 events. And so these different efforts, attending uh, HBCU events, visiting the classrooms, how are we, um, I guess, so yes, how are we looking at the data to, again, structure and kind of guide those efforts that you're doing? And then I have a, I do have a second piece to that question, but I'll wait for the answer. Susan, so you want to go ahead? I see you take. Go ahead. So um, I'm not sure if I understood the question. I want to just make sure I did. So you're wondering how we came up with the 60% of the events? Is that what you're asking me? That were targeted to recruit teachers of color? No. So I was giving it as like a second example of the question that I've asked about how are you using the data to guide and even like refine your efforts or how does it shape your efforts in hiring and uh, recruiting? So we do go back each year and look at our um, recruitment data, how many candidates we were able to meet while we were at different events, as well as how many hires we were able to make. Um, we go back and look at things um, where we met the candidates, you know, whether it was online through in-person events. And then we also look to target more events than 
either attend those same events next year, reduce some of the events where we were not as successful, and then find new opportunities where we can um, ensure that we're going to have opportunities to meet more teachers of color um, so that we're our potential like right now we're working on the recruitment schedule for next year and we're looking at you know that data to see how many candidates we've met and and how many we've hired and new events where we can go to okay great so then like continuing in that um is there a hand i see Ms. Charlie, I see Ms. Harvey and Ms. Charlie Green. I'm sorry, I didn't see those hands up before. So no, and 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 thank you. I just wanted to to add to the responses of the team, which I certainly appreciate. Um, there there is another piece to this that I'd like to share, and that is we know that recruitment is key, uh, but we also know it's equally important to retain the teachers that we have. And so we've created affinity groups where we actually have the opportunity to sit down with and speak to our staff members of color and identify what needs are and to try to make sure that we are adjusting our practices to meet those needs. Um, recently, the um, equity team has partnered with HR and they have actually been attending those events and really trying to make sure that some of the needs that came out of those conversations are met, namely uh, a person or an individual that they know that can guide them through the process, follow up, um, clarifying some things and, and acting in that role. So just really having conversations with our own staff, in addition to looking at the hard data, looking at that anecdotal data and trying to make adjustments um, accordingly. I mean, I'll just share very plainly. Uh, we know that 70% of the teaching workforce, you know, is not, does not meet the definition of diverse candidates. And we also know that the enrollment in teacher prep programs is reducing. And so one of the things that we've really tried to focus on is making sure that we are keeping the people we have because there are not more people coming on board or coming into the teaching profession. And then where there are folks, uh, making sure that we are increasing our presence there. We've more than doubled our footprint at HBCUs. Uh, we've done a number of outreach efforts. And so we use that data to refine our work, both the um, concrete data as in numbers, as well as the anecdotal data. So I did just want to add that piece so it wasn't lost. Thank you. Ms. Harvey, did you have a, a question as a follow-up, I guess, or did you have some questions that you wanted to ask? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. I did have a follow-up question along the lines of um, the previous conversation. Um, and, and I think uh, you answered it in terms of how you use the recruitment data to, to determine which uh, activities, recruitment activities are most effective, uh, which is a good, you know, way to parse out your resources. Um, I wondered if you had that data um, to say that we find that this particular activity is the most effective, um, this particular activity we've, we've limited because it doesn't yield um, the results that we seek. And then I wondered if, if you are aware of any jurisdictions nationwide even that are performing above the national average and reached out to them to see what they're doing or what the dynamics are in their jurisdiction that are allowing them to perform at higher levels than what the national average may be. We actually um, have been doing some research, honestly, as early as this afternoon, looking and starting to really benchmark and look to um, different districts um, and pull information together. I don't off the top of my head have that available, um, but we definitely are right now um, working on recruitment plans for the upcoming year and are definitely looking to see what neighboring districts that are um, exceeding in the state as well as across the nation and trying to you know, look at their different opportunities and where they've had success. Thank you. And keep in mind, Ms. Harvey, too, one of the things I wanted to share and try to make it a, bring home with that point was the teacher preparation program uh, slide and showing how it's not just here in, in the state of Maryland, but it is across the country 
where people are turning to uh, a number of different creative ways to recruit teachers by looking within and, um, and, and looking within meaning like doing their own grow our own programs. Uh, finding peer educators, those who are in different positions who may have a degree, may not have a degree, but helping them work towards that degree. So that was one of the uh, the reasons for showing definitely that that particular slide. But thank you for that question. And as, as Stansbury did mention, we are certainly looking at maybe there are other other school systems that are out there who are uh, doing some things maybe just you know a little bit better. We can always look at some some uh, at another district and say, okay, well maybe this didn't work for us. Maybe it worked for them. Or how did that work? And and sort of uh, collaborate with them. So uh, that is something that we uh, certainly are. Uh, not opposed to, uh, and certainly would uh, would uh, welcome, and uh, that's that is on our radar. So thank you for that question and suggestion. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, I see Mr. Handy, you have your hand raised. Yes, thank you, Mr. Frempong. Um, I just wanted to also respond to Ms. Harvey's question. And Ms. Harvey, I know you asked specifically about school systems. Um, there are a few organizations that work uh, across the country to do this work we're talking about. A few come to mind. Uh, one is the uh, Build Our Networks of Diversity or uh, the Bond Project. Um, another is the Center for Black Educator Development. They're based out of Philadelphia, but again, they do national work. And there's also, uh, it's a, um, it's an organization out of Bowie State, and it has kind of a lengthy name, but it's really focused on black male educators and also the wellness of, of black male students. So um, been partnering with those organizations. Um, I know some of my colleagues in HR have done the same. Um, if we uh, start to get into our blueprint work and plan, those organizations are actually written into the plan. So uh, this year, I, I believe we'll be intensifying efforts to work with them. So this idea of you know trying to learn from other school systems, um, be it directly or through organizations such as the ones I've named. Um, I believe that what we learned this year as we saw, you know, solidify those partnerships uh, will also yield some results. And, you know, understanding the questions that uh, Ms. Harvey and Ms. Frempong have asked about, you know, uh, you know, which efforts have paid off and which ways I think we'll have some more information. I know we regularly bring you all um, hiring updates throughout the year, so I think, um, throughout the course of this year, um, we'll have some more information on how those efforts are paying off. Great, thank you. I appreciate the, um, just for my increased understanding that we're partnering with organizations outside of direct um, school system to school system partnerships. So thank you. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. All right, so I again continue with questions. And so um, also thank you, Ms. Charlie, for mentioning about retention. So this presentation for today, we had structured it so it was just focused on um, the hiring and recruiting. And so um, I hope to hear that information again because we will be looking to also do um, a presentation around the retention and what we are doing to uh, retain our teachers of color. So thank you for kind of giving us a, a head start on that and showing how that also ties into the recruiting and hiring. So um, with the TPP slide, Mr. McCall, um, just wanted to be clear on um, that data. That is national data that was being presented on that um, on that slide. That is correct. Yes, that is national data. OK, and so is there data available that shows, um, I guess, what that looks like for the state of Maryland or even the local region? And is it showing like the same? trend. I suspect it is, but I was just wondering if we have that information and, and have access to that information as well. I don't have that right on hand. I'm sorry, but uh, there is information that could be pulled that actually gives you the opportunity to pull uh, to show by state. And for that, it is on a, uh, also on a uh, trajectory that shows a decline uh, as it does for uh, for the nation. So um, I, I, it, it would I hate to say it'd be wonderful if all of these uh, these enrollees or completers were here in the state of Maryland, uh, but we don't have that luxury. But it, it can be divided or at least um, disaggregated by uh, by state. 
Something to add to that as well is even in the good days <laughs> when teacher preparation programs are plentiful in the state of Maryland, we never produced enough teachers to fill the school districts here. Um, so now in times of tight um, teacher preparation enrollment, it is really tight. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So that's interesting, and thank you for that data, Ms. Stansberry. So for our our teachers that are produced here in the state of Maryland, are most of them though still staying local, or are they leaving to go to other uh, jurisdictions? I can speak more anecdotally to that. I don't have the data in front of me. Um, what? Over the years of my experience, what we found is the majority stayed here. However, there were some that come to Maryland just for education, and they do attempt to return to their their home states. Um, in past years, the bordering states like Pennsylvania, New York, Michigan, they didn't have vacancies. They didn't have opportunities for teachers to teach there. So the people who had come here for school, they often stayed here for at least three years with us. We were able to recruit from those states um, and gain people who might have been long-term subs for three years and not able to stay at home in those states. And they would come to us as well. Um, and now they're all hiring. <laughs> I see. So we do kind of have a regional issue where now, I guess, as more opportunities open up in neighboring states, it becomes a little bit more competitive for Maryland and, and filling the spots here as well. Absolutely. Very much. And okay. to that point, Ms. Frembrog, we actually do. I have the numbers for Maryland. The uh, Those who entered or enrollees in the program in Maryland uh, for that same time span, we're looking at 2012, 13,000. Uh, actually enrolled, and uh, in 2023, uh, 22, 23, that number is, uh, for enrollees was 6,500. Uh, for completers, uh, even more bleak, 3,000 uh, in 2012, and then 1,900 in uh, 22, 23. Definitely bleak. So I guess another thing is, um, it, colleges are always struggling with uh, retention of students as it is. So typically the numbers are lower for uh, the students completing versus the students that entered. So uh, I guess one thought is, and is there any way, I don't know, but just kind of throwing things out there, is there any way to provide support to um, these TPPs um, so that potentially we can help to um, increase the number of completers. I would see that as like a win-win. It's a win for the college increasing their retention and graduation rates. And it's a win for us uh, by providing um, another pipeline uh, or another way of getting uh, teachers into our system. If if I may, team, answer that one. Um, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Frempong, for that question. Um, l early last year, uh, Dr. Rogers has met with all of the um, presidents, as well as the folks who are affiliated with education programs in uh, the uh, colleges and universities in our area, that's HBCUs, uh, PWIs, all of those schools, um, meeting in three groups with those university presidents uh, to identify what the needs are and basically to create a pipeline for students leaving their campus and coming to ours. One of the things that came out of that is they identified uh, the praxis, uh, the test that teachers must take as one of those barriers. And so even looking at, you know, support that we could provide as students were going through that process with guarantees on the other side, depending on their performance. So there were a number of ways that we are trying to to almost create a handoff with certain institutions so that we can guarantee um, at least a pipeline of students. Students obviously have choices, but we're hoping that um, if we strengthen those pipelines, we'll be able to you know, somehow, you know, keep uh, those folks who are at least local or who are graduating from the programs that are nearby. So that is ongoing. Fantastic. Thank you. I just have a couple more questions. I'm trying to pull my questions up. Um, OK, and so this this all so this is the equity committee. This is our presentation here and then um, we have seen, though, that this is the priority is hiring uh, effective teachers, leaders, and staff. And so, but as a component of that, 
it is, we are also, um, I guess, hiring, we're looking at hiring a, div a diverse workforce, correct? That is correct. Okay. And it's just one of those things where I just wanted to um, make sure I get clarity on that because it's it's interesting that we have Maryland Blueprint Pillar 2, and it's specifically calling out this high quality and diverse teachers and leaders. But even as we talk about like our presentation today, it's just the highly effective um, teachers, leaders, and staff. And even as I look at the background and the overview, it's it's higher level and more general. And we see like one line to recruit diverse candidates versus even looking at the background. In my, in my opinion, I'm looking at this as we are a majority minority system um, as far as our students. And we're looking to, you know, have teachers that uh, are reflecting of the students that we serve. Um, and so it just, just my opinion, but it can it can give the appearance of this diversity is actually a afterthought instead of a focus and being deliberate and intentional. And so I just kind of wanted to provide that feedback um, because I think it's important that it is recognized that BCPS has this commitment to equity um, and to diversity um, and that we um, are being intentional and deliberate in this effort. Thank you. I'm sorry, Mr. McCall, are you going to say something else? Because I did have another question, but I'll I'll wait. Or... No, the, well, I do appreciate uh, your your feedback. I will say that that is something that has that I do hold near and dear, uh, just personally. Um, when even as a parent here with children who have finished school in Baltimore County Public Schools. Um, from K through 12. And I can say, and you know, over the, over the course of their um, matriculation here in, in BCPS, uh, there has been a change in the number of, of teachers that they've had of color. Um, and I will say, even when I was in a different uh, uh, position in a different school system, but a parent of a child who was here, it was to my uh, dismay that um, at a time, even in the early 2000s, where I was sitting in an auditorium with um, with a lot of parents, many a number of parents who looked like me. And in that, uh, on the stage where the principal who's no longer with us uh, now uh, was, uh, was a white principal and everyone on the stage were, uh, they were white teachers. Um, but the one person that was introduced as a person of color on the staff was uh, an African American, but not in, not to say that there was any um, any uh, position that's beneath a position. But nonetheless, the only person that this that this principal could refer to as a person of color on staff was the BSW in the building, and introduced that to the audience of the uh, of the. Uh, parents who were there. Um, to date, I can say even with the strides that we made with principals uh, and also with our teacher and staff, I'm proud to say that we have made some strides. Uh, it won't turn over overnight, but at the same time, it is what something that I do hold near and dear, and I don't take it lightly. Um, especially, fortunately, my, my children had someone in, at their home to look up as parents who are educators. Uh, to say um, as a um, as role models, but not every, and I understand that not every child has that. So we want to make sure that we do have uh, professionals also in the classrooms that are teaching not only um, our, our children of color, but also there's something to gain from our our, our students, our students who are um, are not of color, our white students can learn from our um, African American teachers. So that's something I do hold near and dear, and I will not uh, let that be something that would not keep us from uh, from moving the work forward and recruiting a diverse uh, staff. So I just wanted to put that in this space. And thank you, um, Mr. McCall. And if I may add just very briefly, Ms. Frumpong, um, and that is uh, the research is very clear 
uh, that the presence of a diverse teaching staff, as well as leaders, it's not just teachers, but assistant principals, principals, and onward and upward, um, is not only beneficial to students of that group, but also to other students. Um, that is to say that it was not just the students who saw themselves in their teachers and leaders who realized the benefit, but students who did not. Um, and so um, who were not of that same group also um, benefited from that presence. So not only is it something that is captured in blueprint, it's something that is a part of, you know, the, the literature that we are grounded in and what we know as educators is a priority and something to strive for. So I do appreciate the feedback related to the appearance, and certainly that is something we will take back. But I do uh, also, you know, just want to iterate that the literature in which we're steeped in is very plain about the benefit of a diverse teaching staff as well as diverse leaders. And so our commitment to that is steadfast because we do want to make sure that our students are able to grow all of them as a result of learning from and learning with a diverse teaching staff as well as leaders. Thank you. I appreciate those comments. Um, Ms. Harvey. Thank you, Madam Chair. So, uh, Mr. McCall, I appreciate your uh, personalizing um, this work and uh, uh, sharing your personal experiences. Uh, many of us have had those experiences, so thank you for that. But it also brought to mind this uh, dilemma we have with the sense of urgency uh, combined with the circumstances that we're in in terms of um, people of color going into the teaching profession and um, the need for all students to see someone who looks like them uh, in teaching in our schools or having leadership positions in our schools. And I wonder, and this might be a question for Mr. Handy. Um, I wonder if there are any um, uh, programs or processes by which we can have I, like guest teacher programs that are not just, oh, we're inviting someone in our class today, but an actual uh, structured program that's designed to create that exposure um, for students as we continue this work of um, having the, the, the uh, educator um, pool look like the student pool. I'm just trying to wonder, are there ways that we can mitigate this circumstance while we're working to uh, improve and have lasting effect? So thank you, Ms. Harvey, for your question. I just want to make sure I understand correctly. So it sounds like you're asking if there can be um, like a way for, if there's a particular school that say does have, a school that has like a low uh, number of teachers of color, um, and a diverse student body that we could perhaps bring in teachers of color from other schools in a guest format or some way. So, so all of our students, regardless of race, are able to see diversity in the teachers. Is that what you're asking? Uh, uh, not even that specific, okay. uh, just broadly, because I don't know. I don't know if there's already some existing organization that um, does this work or you know, I didn't even think about like internally rotating teachers um, as guest. Te I just this concept of maybe having guest teachers that are actually either teachers or subject matter experts that come in in a structured way, not like just, hey, today we're going to have a guest speaker, not a guest speaker, a teacher, <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. someone who's going to teach in some structured, consistent way to infuse uh, exposure and diversity within the school as we continue to do this work of recruiting and retaining um, a, a diverse teacher and leadership uh, staff. Okay, gotcha. I understand. So it's almost like a guest <laughs> lecture, almost, right? Um, something like that. But I know we want, not, not <laughs> necessarily a lecture format, but some way provide that teacher to be involved, that, that individual to be involved. Um, I That's an interesting concept. I haven't thought about that. Um, I will take note of that as an idea, something that we could look into. Uh, I'm thinking of the few ways we could, you know, perhaps, you know, make that happen, maybe on um, on a small scale and try to scale it up. I'm gonna put, I might put um, Ms. Simons on the spot a little bit. I know at one point, 
related to what you're asking, Ms. Harvey, there was an opportunity for like an an adjunct uh, mm -hmm. circumstance, if you will, uh, that MSDE was allowing for. Ms. Simons, do you know what I'm referring to? Um, this was before COVID, but and a lot of it did seem to pertain to like career and technical ed, where you might have someone with expertise um, that you wanted to share with students, but you know it was difficult to hire them as a teacher of record. And it seemed like at some point there was like an option to do some type of adjunct work, and that might actually uh, pertain to what Ms. Harvey is asking about too. But does that sound familiar, Ms. Simons? You know what I'm talking about? He, yes, I believe you're referring to. Uh, one of the uh, certification areas, sorry, licensure areas um, uh, that's available through regulation. It It is an adjunct option, and that's reserved for opportunities or instances where there's a unique um, need to bring in, um, say it's a, a symphony, orchestra conductor or someone with unique skills um, that comes in to teach one or two classes, we could hire an individual with that unique skill to come in. And that's a cert a licensure option for that individual. Um, but it, it, it is for um, it, an individual contract with the school system because um, a license can only be issued to someone contracted uh, through a state state contract um, to receive that type of licensure. But we can we can figure that out if that is something to wonder or ponder over. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. So, I'm sorry. Yes, thank you. I, thought that no, might I was just saying I, I wonder if we might consider the need for diversity, particularly in the most underrepresented schools where the ratio is is the most askew, might we consider that a unique need and, and use this particular uh, avenue? And that may just be an option. Like I said, I'm not familiar with everything that's out there, but it just struck me that off, this is a, as, as you all have said, this, this is not gonna be resolved overnight. And we have students right now today that are, missing out on the richness that diversity can bring in an educational setting and are there ways that we can mitigate that while we're doing this long-term work yes i understand yeah thank you for that that question and i think the the adjunct uh piece that Ms. simons talked about could be a vehicle to help diversify um, along those lines too, but certainly something um, that we'll look into. So thank you, Ms. Harvey. Thank you. So um, as Ms. Harvey has spoken about, um, it, right, this isn't going to, to change overnight as we work to increase the diversity in um, the workforce so that it is more representative of the students and communities that we serve. So. Um, and we've we've seen that from the data we understand that we have a workforce that is um, not the same. While we are majority minority for our student population, that's not the case for our um, teachers and leaders in the system. So as we continue hiring, um, I do understand that there's some training during orientation for new teachers. Um, but I wanted to, I guess, can you speak to what type of pre-screening process or tools um, are used in hiring. So as you're interviewing and deciding to hire individuals, um, if we talk about the concepts of cultural responsiveness and cultural competency or proficiency, how much are we using that as a lens or a gauge um, when we are hiring and interviewing uh, prospective teachers into our system? So we definitely use that. Um, Doug's team actually does a great job uh, developing training with our principals and assistant principals, and they are the main interviewers for those coming into their schools. Um, and they do a tremendous amount, and every single um, screening interview does consist of questions about equity. Okay, great. So that's fantastic. So it sounds like we have a pre-screener um, for um, 
teachers that are coming into the system. Um, there is orientation at the beginning for new teachers, but then do we have any type of process for um, teachers that are already in the system? So I'll just, for an example, I'll speak high level, um, but you know, if we are aware of a teacher who's in the system and uh, has spoken publicly maybe against LGBTQ or misrepresented desires or views of African-American community, like where is the, do we have that continuous training for um, or screening for a teacher so that they can continue to work on those skills? Because if it were, they have professional development. Um, so if they were having trouble with math, teaching math and had some skills they needed to get, you know, strengthened or they were just kind of weak in those areas, then the teacher would um, have access to that training. So, you know, do we have that same type of thing for um, when we talk about equity and dealing with students of color and just other, you know, what's not considered to be the majority? Because again, in our system, we're majority minority. Uh, so, Ms. Frempong, I'll start. So, thank you for that question. So, um, if you look at our, you know, approximately 9,000 teachers, um, as Ms. Stansberry stated, we certainly, uh, just looking at the numbers, frankly, try to uh, prioritize our work around uh, principals and their instructional leadership teams. Um, usually part of that team is our staff development teachers, um, and you've heard Dr. Rogers talk quite a bit about our commitment to our, you know, having staff development teachers in our schools. Uh, they're typically uh, the ones who will work with, uh, well, they will work with all teachers in the building. So uh, we, my team, uh, worked with the staff development teachers last year through their monthly professional development, uh, looking to do the same this year, uh, depending on, uh, you know, whatever their priorities are, we'll make sure we continue uh, to work with those staff development teachers. So we're looking to build their capacity uh, to do some of the things you talked about. So if a staff development teacher is talking to uh, whether it's a new teacher, experienced teacher, what have you, about their um, instructional practice, making sure that they are bringing that equity lens to their practice, making sure it's culture responsive to each student in their classroom. So that's one way we address that. Um, another way is through our equity liaisons. I'm very happy to report that this year our equity liaisons uh, through the leadership of uh, Dr. Rogers uh, is one, our equity liaisons are one of three mandatory um, extra duty activities for schools. So that means each school is going to have an equity liaison. Sometimes schools will do a co-liaison, um, but we're very excited, my team and I, that we have uh, these liaisons in place. We'll be working with the liaisons to help build their capacity to do some of the work that you described. Um, again, we know uh, this is long term work, uh, so we'll build the capacity of liaisons um, and at the same time we do expect them to help build the capacity of their fellow staff members. Uh, we also can go in directly and work with uh, schools, you know, at the teacher level, really at any level um, of the staff if we find that there are needs um, around teachers being um, culture responsive, um, you know, applying an equity lens to their instruction, being reflective in their practice, things of that nature. So uh, we do have some systems in place um, that I think will uh, lend itself to that ongoing uh, support for teachers uh, with an eye on them uh, being culture responsive to uh, the needs of each student in their classroom. Fantastic, thank you. And definitely that's a win for um, the system to have the equity liaisons. And I remember working on that as part of the Equity Advisory Council. So, so pleased to see that as these things bubble up from our community and stakeholders about um, you know, what their concerns are, what's important that we see the system is is responding um, to those concerns and getting these things implemented because the outcomes um, are really what people are looking at. So thank you. Okay. Are there any other questions or comments um, for today's meeting? Okay, I'm not seeing any. So the last item on the agenda is announcements. The next equity committee meeting with the Equity Advisory Council is scheduled for Thursday, September 26, 2024 at 5.30 p.m. The next equity committee meeting is scheduled for Thursday, October 10th, 2024 at 4 p.m. Is there any further business? Hearing none, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Good night.
All right. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you,